some of you may know me, some of you may not. My name is Kim Jansen, and it is an incredible privilege to be with all of you this morning. Um, and as you know, as is the usual with our webinars with the Innovative Trust, if you've got any questions, we really want to see them and have our guest expert answer them, of course. So please drop your questions into the Q&A box and we will check them and make sure that we get to your questions. Now, you also know who the Innovator Trust is, but it would be remiss of me not to give them a proper introduction. As many of you will know, they were established in 2014 and they've really solidified their reputation as a beacon of hope that supports, maintains and helps grow black owned and black women owned businesses in the ICT sector. And for the past decade, yes, they celebrate 10 years this year. So I think it's a year long of celebration. Zama's clapping hands for us already on that side. They've successfully catapulted countless businesses to success. They've aided in their sustainable growth and really the Innovator Trust has made such a notable contribution to our country's economic development as a result of that. And I think the webinars like these are just a testament of the incredible work and vested interest that, in the, that the Innovate Trust has in ensuring that SMMEs do succeed. And at this point in time, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce the expert that we have who's going to be taking you through a really critical topic this morning. And that's, of course, Zama Mkosi. Zama, it is such a privilege to have you with us. You're a business and media lawyer. You call yourself a serial entrepreneur. You're a <laughs> creative economy academic. You're a policy specialist. And you've made your mission clear, Zama. And that's really to empower business owners with the knowledge that we need we need um, to make legally informed contract decisions. It's a it's a big topic. It's a massive yeah. topic, and we're often intimidated by it. But you know that it's what we need to grow our businesses. You're a qualified attorney with over twenty years' experience, a COO of multiple organizations in the private and public sector. And I think what's most exciting for me is that you've conceptualized the basics of business contracts, and this is an online course. And this course has restored the confidence and success rate of business owners when it comes to handling contracts. I could go on, but we only have a limited time with you. So Zama, on behalf of the Innovator Trust and everyone here, it's such a privilege to have you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, it really, really is an honor and a privilege to uh, steal the entrepreneur's time. I know time as an entrepreneur is very precious, and I really commend each one of them for, for making time really to empower themselves in this way, because in that way, they are working on their businesses as opposed to always working in their businesses. So I will you know, try and be uh, speak very fast and go straight to the point. And I will also so that we allow time for questions as we go along. Uh, but also I really I will try and simplify things as much as possible. Um, that really is is my core when it comes to legalities for business owners, because they can, as Kim said, they can often be intimidating and and then we end up not looking into them uh, and then we end up you know, facing trouble uh, down the line. So my whole aim is to really simplify it as much as I can, just have a conversation about them as much as possible. I'm going to share my screen Today, we're just going to be talking about um, service level agreements. I know this is a broad topic and each one of us, you know, we enter into various kinds of service level agreements. Um, but we are, oh, this is just a, a little bit about who I am. I think most of it has been shared. Um, my mission has been said um, that it's really about supporting SMEs, you know, to grow and sustain their businesses by making sure that their legalities are in order, um, but also understand their legalities, not only just um, drafting the contracts for them or registering trademarks for them, which I do, but at the core of it, I really just want each one of us as business owners to be empowered. And hence, I'm really passionate about the legal education side of things. Okay, 
today we are going, you know, with the time that we have, we're going to just do an overview of um, the SLA. We're going to look into key clauses um, in an SLA agreement. We're going to talk about the rights and obligations that arise out of these key clauses. And we're going to look more importantly at the legal and business consequences, because that's something that I just want all of us to keep at the back of our heads, that every document, it is really not just about the words that are written there, but it is about, you know, um, the legal and the business implications of things. And so each time you are faced with a, with a document and we have to make a decision about whether to sign it or not, or whether to read it or not, at the back of it, think about you know, what are the legal and business consequences of it? And um, and the way that we're going to go about it, um, we, we're, going to, we're going to cover all of these as I go through typical clauses. I'm going to touch on what are the rights and obligations that arise from the different clauses and what are some of the uh, business and legal consequences that we need to always be aware of. Okay, as an overview, an SLA, a service legal agreement, regardless of industry or anything, it is really about regulating the relationship and the expectations between the parties that are entering into. Because this is the same for every other agreement. Um, you will agree with me that regulating um, a, any relationship, particularly a business relationship, it is really important. It's not about only when something goes wrong, but it's also about making sure that there is clarity of expectations as to what the different parties need to do. Um, I also just listed here, once again, the importance of having an SLA, establishing clear expectations, uh, being clear around who has a responsibility to do what, who is accountable for what. Um, obviously, to avoid potential legal disputes, because if there is a signed agreement, that is at least the first place to start uh, before you are forced to institute any, any legal action. And if it gets to that, then at least you do have a document that guides what was supposed to happen in the first place, because try... Uh, instituting legal action when you don't even have a signed agreement, that makes it even more difficult. And hopefully, when you do have an SLA in place, you can, you know, usually the way that they are drafted, they will provide for other steps that can be taken as a way of resolving the issues before they really result in a court a legal dispute. And also why SLAs are important to ensure compliance and quality service delivery. There's nothing worse than when there is no understanding as to uh, what uh, what delivery means and what level of service is expected. You can find yourself really entering into a dispute even before you start because the, because you think you're supposed to deliver X Y Z and the and the entity you you are delivering in two things you are supposed to deliver A B C or even dates and things like that. So to ensure compliance and quality of service, that's why you need um, to have an SLA. And then also it helps to understand, you know, performance measurements and financial implications thereof. And I will talk a bit uh, more around, around that because this is uh, one of the biggest risks when it comes to uh, SLAs, the issue of me uh, measuring performance and the financial implications if performance is, you know, either way. Now, the key clauses for, for any SLA, um, the parties, I mean, the standard clause, we know we always see it. Um, and we're still going to go deeper into each of these, but I just thought I just put the slide just, you know, so that any SLA that you enter into, you've got an understanding that at least it must outline who the parties are that are entering into that contract. It must outline what are the overall objectives, what is the aim of um, of this agreement, what is it meant to cover, that, you know, that the, any SLA must talk into that. There must be a description of the services, you know, the, the services that are being um, uh, rendered, um, they must be fully, fully described and there must be clarity around that. And, um, and and the performance levels and the compensation, which is the payment part of it, 
uh, the NSLA has got to talk to that as to how payment is going to be made and so on. And the reporting, if there are any reporting or any other obligations that um, that the parties have, those need to be um, uh, outlined in an SLA. And obviously the consequences as to what happens if any of these is not done or is done in a way that um, is not... Um, is not um, how it should be. Okay, all right. And then, um, and then I'm just gonna go and look at um, the key clauses and and their legal implication in a bit more in a bit more detail. Now, um, if you look at uh, the parties, you know the clause that is titled parties. You find that it is usually um, people usually gloss over such clauses and um and yet they are very very important you can find that the document that you are relying on is not worth the paper it's written on simply because the description of the parties is not what it should be now that is very important you know when you when you put that radio company registration number when you enter into a contract with any third party the description of the parties is very important. And I'm just making an example, for instance, with the contract that maybe most of the people in the in the in the webinar are, are familiar with, you know, the SLA between, you know, the Innovator Trust. And I just use the word trust quite a lot because I'm just going to use that SLA as, a, as an example, but the principle applies to any other SLA that you may enter into. And, and the example here is that, for instance, in this SLA um, with the, with the, the trust enters into, there can be other parties that are described um, because maybe you entering into an SLA and the purpose of the SLA is for you as, as, as a service provider to deliver services for an intended beneficiary. So the intended beneficiary, as an example, is not a party to the agreement, but they, you know, the, the, the very core of the reason that this um, uh, agreement is entered into is for the benefit of a third party. And so it's very important for, 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 for you to be aware of that and to be aware of how it's defined and you are clear about that because um, if you don't pay attention to that, you may find that you may end up being in non-compliance um, just because you did not pay attention to the fact that as much as my agreement is between uh, me and Innovator Trust, but there is also this third party, which is the intended beneficiary, who is specifically defined in a particular way as to, you know, it, it is an entity that complies with X, Y, Z, and so on and so on. And you have to have a clear understanding as to what those, um, those descriptions are. And, um, and now quickly moving on to, I, I think I need to pick up my pace because I'm worried about time at all. I, Zara, I have a quick question that actually before you move on, um, okay. it goes back to this particular page mm -hmm. about description of services. Um, and Tapi Singh wants to know what if as the project continues, both you and the client realize that the scope of the service is not what they envisioned when they went to tender. What recourse of action do they have then, especially when dealing with government contracts where scope of variation is close to none? Is there a recourse of action? Well, usually they 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 should be in an SLA a a, a clause that talks about um, firstly that variations can only be done in writing, and okay. so that is the first thing that I would advise and be saying to always insist on that variations must always be in writing. That's the first thing, and then particularly you know for for tender. Um, in, in, in a tender context, that is exactly where, you know, as a service provider, you need to be absolutely cautious because you may find that a, an, a, an, an, an entity can ask you to do additional work, which is out of scope, even of the tender. And, and then you go and do that work. And then when it's time to claim for payment, you do not have a contractual leg to stand on because that 
they asked you to do something that was even out of the terms of reference. And so, and it is very much your responsibility as a service provider to be clear around mm -hmm. what the scope allows because entities will always take advantage. Um, I can say that they will always ask you to do more. And if you keep saying yes, you may actually not be able to claim. And so it is on you to be clear what those uh, what what the thing is and make sure that it is done in writing so that you have um you have uh, uh, evidence but we're going to also just talk about even even in a non tender scenario and in an example like um any agreements with the trust i think there is some clauses that talk to how that is dealt with excellent thank you okay um now in, in the interpretation clause um the inter interpretation clause is also one of those clauses that um that it's so easy to 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 overlook sometimes it's it's written definitions clause and you think i oh, know it's just definitions you know you know you don't need to pay attention to them but but here's the trick the the, the way that those um terms are defined in there there are certain implied rights and obligations that are contained in there that you need to understand. I mean, starting even for the um, how the the in the definition section, there may be a definition of a commencement date or start date or you know however it's phrased, and that is very important because sometimes you you know the the commencement date is defined as it's a fixed date, and sometimes it says commencement date is the date when the agreement will be signed by both parties. Now that is that is a huge uh, distinction because you you know most of the time we know that legal contracts often take a while to sign and by then maybe you are doing some work already, but you may be doing work and sign an agreement afterwards and the agreement says a contract only comes to effect on the day that it is signed, and then what happens if you've already spent months doing the work? In reality, you do not have a contractual um, uh, basis for having done that work before. But all of that you will find in this definition section in how the commencement date of the agreement is defined. And so I'm just emphasizing that, that don't skim too quickly through these uh, definitions because there may be things in there that are important. For instance, you know, defining time period, when the agreement is going to start, when the agreement is going to terminate, uh, deliverables, what is meant by deliverables, what will amount to deliverables, you know, definition of the services, description of the services, because you'll find that those descriptions are in the definition section, they're not in the rest of the other clauses. That is where they will tell you that by services, we mean X, Y, Z, Bada, 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 bada. you know, and that you have to be clear about that and you have to be sure that you understand what you are then uh, uh, committing yourself to sign on. Um, there's even, you know, for example, in this document with the, with the Innovator Trust, even purchase orders, what is meant by purchase orders is, is outlined in the definition section so that when you get uh, some other written piece of paper or you get a WhatsApp uh, that says do X, Y, Z, it's not a purchase order. It has to be a purchase order according to what it is defined in this section. And so that that is uh, the importance of this uh, clause. Um, and then there is, um, you know, other sections in, in SLAs that often talk about you know effective date duration and and introduction and um and in there as well they they also you know outline around the core of the agreement the core purpose of the agreement and um legal implications um around timelines and when the agreement is also going to terminate and how it is going to be terminated um you know that is very important because you may you as a service provider, you may be excited that you've signed this contract. It's a three-year contract, all is well. And you miss out one tiny clause that says that either party may terminate this agreement um, by giving the other 30 days priority notice. And that's it. Boom. That's the end of that. And if you miss that part and simply focused on the part that you have a three-year contract and miss this one line, 
you may end up investing um, for a three-year commitment, and yet there is just this one clause that says, on written notice, someone can terminate this contract in 30 days. So it is really um, critical for you to understand um, you know, such clauses about duration, uh, because that you can also plan your business and be aware that there, there is this risk, even if you have been awarded a contract. Um, now, there is also, um, you know, the other clauses then and talk about purchase orders. It's very important um, because every company, the reason that they, um, you know, th this talks to the payment because, you know, when we are busy doing the work, everyone is busy and everyone is excited and we're in the business of doing the work. But then small things like, you know, purchase orders, the approval of purchase orders, the format of purchase orders, the format of approvals, those things can really make or break whether you are able to demand payment or not. And you need to be clear about what will amount to a, a purchase order and um and and at what point is it going to be a valid uh, purchase order, which then you know uh, gives you then the right to do the work and therefore claim um the work. Um, I know that you know there are timelines that are given around when these purchase orders would be approved and when what must be sent. Make sure that you are very clear about that so that you can also communicate that to the team. Uh, let's say you've got a team in your company that deals perhaps with um, with with, uh, with with purchase orders, you are focusing on the actual technical part of the business. You need to be able to communicate to that team as to exactly how what they should do and how they should do it, because that way you can make sure that when the time comes for you to claim for the work, that you know those boxes um are ticked so don't skimp on understanding you know clauses such as um such as this one um and then they there will be a clause called service level agreement um but sometimes it can also be a clause that outline the actual services to be delivered sometimes it's just going to say services um, and often this clause outlines the obligations um, for the service provider. So the one that is going to be providing the service, this clause outlines exactly what they should deliver. And that description is either in the body of the agreement or it can be in the annexure. And which talks again to the importance of read those annexures and be clear because it's in, if it simply says the services as described in annexure A, be sure you go to Annexure A and be clear as to what it says, because sometimes those annexures may be based on a proposal that you made, but that proposal was six months ago. And since then, there's been other engagements. And by the time an agreement is signed, the actual delivery is going to look very different than what the proposal you submitted. And yet, when the contract is being signed, they attach your proposal and you now have to deliver according to the proposal, but the reality is that what you are going to deliver is very different. So you have to make sure that the description of the services is accurate and it is detailed so that it avoids any issues down the line where there's argument about what was supposed to be, um, what was supposed to be what. Um, also in here, there will be, you know, references to uh, to to what is required um, as a, as as an acceptable level of service, as to what then constitutes a breach if you do not deliver um, according to X Y Z, it's going to be considered a breach. Uh, so you need to be sure that you understand and you are not taken by surprise. Um, I think the one clause that I uh, that was of interest for me when I when I, I was reading through the, the the agreements for the trust that I think is going to be important for you to always understand is um, we mentioned the, the the issue of the intended beneficiary earlier. And sometimes, in fact, there is a clause 6.5 on, on the trust agreement that talks about what happens if that intended beneficiary, which is the entity that benefits from your services, if they leave the program, you know, what are the implications? And you have to be clear about that because 
that that clause outlines what your responsibilities are and what the implications are because there may be um, the responsibilities to replace but there may also be certain implications when you have to um, refund certain payments. Uh, so watch those timelines very carefully uh, when it comes to that. And then I just uh, made a point about this uh, the clause. Uh, in It's written uh, project, but in other SLAs, it can also just be referred to as um, you know, um, oversight responsibilities because this is um, where it is outlined as to the person to whom the services are being provided as to what right they have to, you know, to give instructions, what right they have to continue to quality control. Um, and, and, and these are also very important. And maybe they also talk to the point um, that Ntabi saying raised about uh, instructions that get given along the way. Um, you know, a, a, a proper SLA should outline how a, a, a continuing instructions should be given along the way. And you also have an obligation to hold the company uh, to that. If they can only do it according to X, Y, Z, then that is what um, that is what you should also demand um, and be clear on, but also be aware then of their right to oversight and quality control. Um, we know that in delivering services, you may need to use third parties. And uh, often SLAs will allow uh, service providers to bring in consultants or bring in third parties uh, to deliver, to help them to deliver on their overall services. But there will be T's and C's as to how that should be done. Uh, first one being the service provider who's contracted would always remain liable. And that uh, the service provider will have obligations to make sure that the person they bring in is skilled and is compliant with whatever you know the 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 the, the company who contracted the service provider wants, and also to um, this is useful because it then enables you when you bring in a third party that you can make sure that you are clear about what they need to comply with, so that you bringing in a third party to subcontract it does not make you now to breach your contract you know with the with the main company so you need to be very very clear around uh, what liabilities you can pass on to that uh, third party and what will remain um, your your responsibility otherwise you can find yourself being in breach because you brought in other people that are not qualified or they are not at the level of skills that is required by the main contract um, then the payment, the payment clause, a very important one. Be very clear around uh, payments, when payment is going to be made, what are the conditions of payment, um, you know, what additional payments um, can you claim for, what out-of-pocket expenses you can claim for, and, and how those um, need to be um, to be done and pre-approved. And um, and they, you know, because you may find that you can only claim if those out of pocket expenses, for instance, have been pre approved, you can only claim for additional things outside of scope if they have been pre approved. So make sure that you are very clear um, around that and they would always be covered in the payment clause. Um, they can also be, you know, be triple B -E requirements. Um, whether for yourself or, or for any subcontractor you bring in or any beneficiary that is part of the program. Um, uh, they, this clause really outlines what the minimum requirements are with regards to that and what are the consequences and the timelines that will be allowed in order to correct that and even how you do that. And so, um, you know, be, 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 be assured that you, you are on top of, of what those are so that you do not find yourself, you know, being non-compliant or having a document that is not an appropriate document for, for verification. Um, I think I'm almost done. I moved to, um, and then I have, um, and then there's um, the clauses that talk to breach and termination. I think I've already spoken quite a bit around um, breach and, and termination and, um, and, and being clear at what point a contract can just be terminated. When you will think it's just like that. 
but it's not necessarily just like that because there is processes that need to be followed if um, if there has to be a termination. But there should be a clause in any SLA that also uh, outlines the obligations of the company or the trust as to what are they going to do? What can you hold them accountable to? Um, and if, if you sign an SLA that doesn't have that, you must just ask, okay, I'm going to deliver all of these things. What are you going to do? Um, and so, um, for instance, I mean, in this document, fine, there is an obligation um, from the trust, you know, to to cooperate and 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 assist um, the, the 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 company that provides the services, uh, provide reasonable access to uh, to its offices, and there also are implications if there is um, if there is non-compliance, and um, and so I think there should be in any event, because it is in any event a, a partnership. So both parties should be um, should have obligations falling on them. Now, reporting. Reporting is a big thing for any SLA. Um, reporting for on, this, on the services that are, are, are being contracted. And the aim is to ensure compliance and accountability. And, um, and any entity may have a, a right to come and audit you as a service provider and not just take your reports at face value. So hence, it is important to always ensure adherence to, to the requirements for, for the reporting because you may find that, you know, you prepare a report, but that it is not, um, it is not sufficient. And then when they come and do an audit uh, and find that all those things that you've written in the report are not what they should be, and you find yourself uh, being uh, being in breach. And these are just some of the examples of the things that you need to make sure that they are there. But each SLA will obviously be different. But I think it's just to make a point about the importance of reporting and keeping appropriate records, because otherwise you can yeah find yourself being non-compliant or being in breach. Um, key SLA risks to manage, uh, regardless of the type of SLA, deadlines, and penalties is the always a, a, a light bulb, a flashing point. It's about deadlines. It's about penalties. When is delivery expected? What happens if you do not deliver? And chances are there will be certain penalties and consequences at all times. Make sure you understand what is supposed to be delivered and what happens if you miss that delivery. I spoke about the quality issues. Um, the level of, of delivery, and we're going to talk about some of the clauses in the last slide after this. Um, additional services, unapproved out-of-pocket costs, I, spoke, I also spoke about that. Doing work outside of approved um, purchase orders is also one of the key risks um, within SLAs that you need to make sure that you are always uh, on top of. Non-compliance with reporting, uh, firstly in terms of timeline, but also in terms of format. And it's usually very difficult to come after the fact and pull together a report when you have not um, uh, pulled in all the source documents even in the first place. So that's why it's important to understand the reporting obligations even before you start doing the work so that you don't find yourself working backwards now. Non-compliance with key performance levels, the implications on, on tranche payments. Uh, we're going to just talk about some of those um, and clauses specifically, and then the verification documents as well. Be clear what are the expected verification documents. Um, otherwise, you may think that you know maybe the slip, handwritten slip from wherever is sufficient, and yet you know you actually need a proper invoice with a tax number with the letterhead or something like that. Be very clear around what what are the expectations in terms of verification documents. Now, um, some of the SLA KPIs, um, I just pulled these out from, um, from, from the standard SLA that the trust often signs with the service providers, but any other SLA, you know, you should have and be clear around what the KPIs are. 
And the whole point about those KPIs is to look at them from the point of view of understanding what implications they have on your business. What do I then need to do? If I, as a company, as a service provider, enter into an SLA uh, to deliver these kind of services that have these particular KPIs, what business arrangements should I I need to have within my business that will then enable and empower me to make sure that I am not in breach. That is the principle that I want you to take out of this. And in this particular example, for instance, if there's KPIs that relate to uh, achieving certain turnover growth, you need to make sure that you implement strategies that you or you, you assist the, the intended beneficiaries to implement strategies that are going to drive the sales and revenue. If there's certain KPIs around profit margins, what are you doing um, to make sure that you assist the intended beneficiaries to provide, you know, uh, the, you know that you uh, provide financial management and advice to improve profitability so that you're not caught off guard when it's time to report. And now you are expected to report on all of these growth um, uh, numbers and so on, and you find that you are taken by surprise if you are not achieving them. You need to put business processes in place to enable you to deliver on your SLA KPIs. Same, you know, staff employment growth, if it is a KPI, what, what, what strategy do you have in place to ensure that you achieve that? The same goes, you know, for certification and so on. Um, and being clear around SLA KPIs enables you to make sure that you've got tracking systems in place and you engage um, with even your own internal team and any other, maybe a third party that you are working with to make sure that everyone is aligned to achieve um, and deliver on those KPIs so that there is compliance um, and everyone can get paid their proper tranches when they are due. Thank you very much. I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, Zama. That was absolutely excellent. I don't think I've ever had somebody, and I've been, you know, consulting for a long time, but making it seem as easy and as <laughs> unintimidating as what you have. So I think I speak on behalf when I of everyone and I say thank you for making this far less intimidating than what <laughs> it actually is. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to zip yeah. through them um, for you. Um, strike. Um, oh, that's... Is that a is that a question? Oh, this is about termination. I think this is a two part question. Under obligations, if a stakeholder or new partner needs your services in schools, but part of the SLA um, is don't charge quintiles one to three, how will you handle it? Who do you have a legal agreement with exactly? Because I guess that that would be the the first question is is to who do you have an agreement with and and what does that agreement specifically say and if you do that action how is that action going to impact on the contract that you have yeah. with the the person that you have a contract with i don't know if if i'm making myself clear um yeah. and because obviously as a principle you can't you can't go and do something that will <laughs> will that, that, will, that you will end up being in breach of yeah. a contract, you know. Okay. But then obviously you've got to assess if what you are doing is actually going to end you up in breach. Because if it isn't, and it's something that is outside of yeah. that relationship that you have, then of course, you know, you can do that. But if there is something that prohibits you from from enter, you know, from, from delivering service to a particular entity or in a particular way, then of course, doing doing that is going to end up in breach. But if it does not fall within that, then yeah. obviously you can. I don't know if I'm... you need. You'd also need a bit more detail around that particular situation. Yes, that's why I'm just maybe sharing as a principle, so that um, so that maybe the person that asked the question can, when they look at it they can look at it with that lens because yeah. obviously they have well, more detail. Yeah. Correct. And then another part or another question under termination, um, Strike also wants to know, how will you respond to an immediate contract on the basis of duplicate services in a single education district? Your company was approved by the district managerial committee. Um, is there any recourse or remedy that they have? 
um, I think they are asking how will you respond um, to media termination on the contract because the services were duplicated and yet they were approved at a district managerial level. Well, it 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 will once again all go back to firstly what the termination provision is in the agreement, and gotcha. and we spoke about you know termination provisions um, for all agreements that there should be a termination um, clause that outlines how what will amount to termination or if there is termination how that is done. So um, so if, if, for instance, there was, I made that example that if, it, if there was a clause that says you can terminate within 30 days, okay, then of course you hold someone accountable, they have to terminate via that. Or if there is a provision that says this agreement will immediately terminate if something else happens, then, you know, you, you go and look at, you go and look into that and it qualifies. But you know, on what basis is any contract being terminated? That has got to be backed up by a particular clause, specific clause in the agreement. So I would also, if you are not clear on what basis any contract is being terminated, you have every right to ask that in reference to the contract that I signed, please direct me to a specific clause that entitles you to terminate so that they can tell you which clause and then you can assess the validity of the termination from there. Okay, that's excellent advice. And I've, we've got Z over here. Who mm. is This is a good one. Who's responsible to prepare the SLA? Is it the client, the service provider, or jointly? And if the client does not prepare one, how do you as the service provider navigate that? Oh, it's a, it's a very important question. Um, and it's a very important question that I often have a... a, a a, a very practical um uh answer to not it's not a it's not a, a hundred percent answer because there's no absolute right or wrong there's there's no this is the person that has a a an obligation it it is all you it's it's all a business decision it's a business decision that any of us make and here are a couple of factors that I always consider if you are a company you must have your standard SLA whatever services you offer, you've got to have your own standard terms. And that is critical. Everyone that delivers services, you've got to have your own um, your own one. So first price and that own one, hopefully you have done the work of, you have contracted a proper lawyer to do it. You didn't just download something from Google or from <laughs> ChatGPT because it is going to end you up I'm glad in, you said that. <laughs> in, in challenges. So it, it is a worthwhile investment to invest in an attorney to draft for you your own standard terms, one. Secondly, if if if, if that, um, obviously, I mean, depending who you're contracting with, if it's a big corporate, <clears throat> if it's a big corporate entity, chances are maybe they will give you their own contract. You know, they will say, this is what we want. And then your yours is to review it and have a look at it and see if there's anything in there that compromises you. If they don't have it, obviously, then chance, hopefully you are ready with, with yours. But if maybe you are in a situation where you have not drafted one because you do have not had resources, um, whether to get help or whatever, you know, you have you know, you can ask them to produce to give you their one, but obviously it comes with that risk that anyone who is the one who's drafted a contract, chances are they have drafted it to their best advantage. Okay. And so you need to make sure that you are going to be able to review it very intensely and pick out things in there that um that are not going to be uh, to your disadvantage. But it is it, but it's helpful to to get them to draft and they can bear the cost of drafting and you only bear the cost of reviewing. So you only then come to me to review it. If you don't have my, if you want to save and don't get me to draft the contract for yourself, you can get the contract from them and only then go to the attorney uh, to help you to review it. Um, so, so yeah. All, all three answers, I think, are correct, depending where you are. But first prize, always have your own, because that, that's yeah. the sure way of protecting yourself. 
I love when you said if you want me to review it because Boy Pelo doesn't have a question, but they say when they say in business you need a lawyer, especially for contracting, they mean exactly this. Thank you, Zava. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a couple of more questions coming in um faith wants to know would you advise that a service provider continues with work with a contract but there's no purchase order she's read on a con she's read a contract on one of the jobs and so with some clauses and some clauses were not clearly stipulated do you go back to the contract drawing board with the client or proceed with the defaulted contract is it defaulted if they don't have a purchase order system in place? Well, if if um, if there is um, a clear <laughs> clause that says that um, that work, um, I've got I can't remember what clause it was. Yeah, but if there's a, a clear clause, for instance, that says that work will only be paid if it was done after an approved purchase order. End of story. Yeah. Any any then other work that gets done when there is no approved purchase order, you are going on risk. Sure. At your own risk. You are really at your own risk. Therefore, you're crossing fingers and hoping and praying someone will be kind to you and they're going to overlook those things down the line. But they have absolutely no obligation to do that. And in fact, you are the one that are putting your business at risk if you continue to do the work when the clause in the agreement was saying that there must first be approved uh, or purchase order before you do the work. If there is no such a clause and it allows you to work even without a purchase order, then of course you are fine. But that that often is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And then linked to that, and I think this is a big red flag, what should you do as a service provider if the client wants to run the project on purchase order terms and conditions, but there's no contract? Your face says it all, Zama. <laughs> well, well, I think the, I mean, I mean, if you're saying purchase order terms, where, where are you getting those? Um, where are you, are you getting those from? The, the purchase order itself, because by contract granted, you don't always need a 50 pager. True. No, not necessarily. You know, that that's not what that's not necessarily all the contract there is. If there is an order, if if there is um an email, <clears throat> then there's an attached a, a purchase order and 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 that email that says we are appointing you to do X, Y, Z on the basis of this uh, approved purchase order as per attached or something. And there is a purchase order. There is the terms and conditions written at the bottom or whatever. You know, that can be a valid contract. So, it's a, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the, the, the full on document. But of course, if it is just a purchase order with three finely written things at the bottom, it may be valid, but chances are there's a whole lot of things that it does not cover. And so you need to be sure that what is listed there at least covers you. Um, well, you are clear about what you are covered and what you are not covered and you are comfortable to still go ahead and do that because, yeah, you, you may go and place an order for a whole lot of things and there's, you know, those yeah. things are not covered and you're putting yourself at risk. Thank you, Zama. And then from um, Philippine, she says they have an SLA in place with a client in the public sector and they've started work, but the SLA hasn't been signed by all parties and they're already having issues in that they are only getting paid per deliverable, but their deliverables are aligned on the client's input and the client can be very slow in actioning their requests. They have six months to finish the work and they only get paid per deliverable, so their payments have been delayed. How mm. do they manage so yeah 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 um <clears throat> well i think it's uh obviously i mean now we're talking when the, the 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 agreement is already signed and obviously the work is already ongoing um maybe to to backtrack a bit and make a point that hence it's important that when you have an sla especially when there is approvals mm that there's got to be timelines that are that are put as to when approval need to happen you know 
if if you can only you know go into production after client has approved then it's going to be indicated that they have x days to approve you know they you know they must approve within x number of days and if an even added bonus is that there is a clause that should say that if no approval is received within x days then you should take it as approval or something like that. That's what those are the kind of clauses that you add when you are drafting your own SLA, because <laughs> you draft it in a way that really, really always makes it um tight for you, so that you never sit in a situation where you are being delayed and yet you are only going to be paid once something is approved and then they take forever to approve. Um, you know, you've got to give yourself room there to say. You know, you've got seven days, and if I don't hear from you in seven days, I take it as approved. We agree that it is an automatic approval, and therefore I have a right to claim payment. You know, but of course, if those things are not there in in the document, then you know, then the client can take advantage and keep stringing you on because the reality is that they do not. There's no timeline by when they need to approve, but instead there is a thing that says you can't be paid until they have approved. But obviously then you have to be strategic on your side and not go on and do other things, you know, when they have not complied with others. And so you have at the very least have to put them on terms. That, that the, the, That's the line. You put them on terms. You say, um, you know, you address it in writing that this is the issue. And therefore, because we have not fixed this, then we are not able to move to the next phase and not moving to the next phase is going to impact the ultimate deliverable. And, you know, put it in a way that says it's not on you. The reason you are not able to move this and you run the risk of missing the six month deadline is because you are not um, being uh, you given the approval, which will enable you to move to the next phase. Something to that effect. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Last couple of questions, because we only have five minutes left. Uh, Aljanita wants to know, they have a an SLA in place for one service. However, the client has asked for additional services. Do they need to add that service to the SLA? Or can they use the current SLA? Well, they, and hopefully the SLA check the clause that talks about variation of the SLA. Go look at that clause. It's open at the back of the document um, where it says how variations are done in the SLA. It will usually maybe say variations can only be in writing and be signed by both parties, something to that effect. And, and then seek for the variation to be done in according to, to that clause. And they it may, some of it may actually be specific to say if we want additional work, this is how it, it should be done and make sure that you, you comply with that. Okay, perfect. Faith also wants to know: should an SLA follow, and last two questions, everyone, should an SLA follow a certain form of contract depending on the industry you're working in? For example, NEC. <laughs> Um, JBCC, GCC, et cetera. What is the impact of these forms of contract on the SLA? Yeah, I, I mean, there, each, there may be industry regulations that absolutely need to be complied with uh, for that are industry specific and, 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 and which is once again, the risk of, you know, downloading stuff and chat AI and all of that to, to, to get contracts for you because they, they may not be aware of um of certain industry um min, minimum requirements and and so yeah no that it's it's completely correct what she's saying that each industry may have its own minimum requirements that need to be complied with and therefore contracted uh, for and also the cost of them being outlined because yeah. sometimes these compliance, they come with a cost. And the SLA needs to be clear sometimes as to who's going to bear the cost of such compliance. Got it. And Zama, last question. Um, Mzee's asking, first of all, before I get to that last question, how much do you usually charge? Um, but I'm sure, Zama, <laughs> they can get your contract details. Is it <laughs> let's, see, let's see. Let's see. Here are my contact details. Here are my contact details. <laughs> 
contact details are on the screen and I know that you can get hold of the Innovator Trust as well. Um, yes. You said they're scared yes. to ask your rates because you're an international <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> don't I, be. Well, what, don't uh, well, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? You know, I will tell you what it is. Uh, look at what the positive of it would be. You may just, you know, save yourself far more by just finding out. And <laughs> trust me. It's worth it. Precisely. And then one last very quick question, everyone. Um, is an SLA considered equivalent to a contract or are they always two separate documents? No, an SLA is a contract. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Zama, thank you so much. Like I said, and Boy Pelo, she she summed it up so succinctly. When they say you need a lawyer, this is what they're talking about. They need Zama on behalf ah! of the <laughs> ah, Boy Pelo, the check is on the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, to you Zama on behalf of everyone online this morning thank you for, for really making this topic uh, approachable much more understandable I'm sure many people are going to reach out to you um, and thank you for your wisdom and your insight to everyone online thank you so much for joining us um, on the 24th yeah. of July there's another one coming up another valuable webinar we live in 4IR this is the digital life that we're in and that one is all about cyber security so please oh, make sure that you keep, exactly so please make sure that you keep an eye out for that one to no, everyone I'll online definitely thank you so join much. Zama's joining as well Zama I will see you online as well for that one but Zama thank you so much um, the pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. And congratulations once again for everyone making the commitment. Um, yes, they can just connect with me even on social media, Instagram. I usually share a lot of information um, yeah, around business law things in a very simplified manner. That really Wonderful. is, is Thank my Thank you so much, Dama. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Okay, lovely. Goodbye.